All right, how are you guys doing this morning? You're going to get loud this morning? Yeah, you're going to say amen? amen? All right, Corey's got it. Who else has got it? Somebody in the back row. JT? Yeah, yeah, you're my back row guy. That's good. Cool. All right, now that the visitors are creeped out, we'll carry on. Well, welcome to Mosaic. Uh, we're excited to have you here. If you are new, hopefully there's a card in your bulletin uh, that you can use. Fill it out. Let us know who you are, how we can love and serve you well. Apparently, we're taking an offering. We might have missed that in terms of prayer. If it comes in lower, we'll know to pray for it next time. That'll be good. Um, yeah, other things. If you're new, we got a connections table out there, all sorts of resources. We would love to, um, love to let you know any questions you have. Frankly, if you're new today, and you want to stick around for a little while, get to know some people, let me buy you lunch, I'd love to buy you lunch. Uh, I already told somebody that was new today, I gave that offer, I said, if you don't like the sermon, I'll find somebody else to buy you lunch. So, so that, if you're new, if this is your first week, standing offer all of you. Uh, last thing to talk about before we actually get into the message this week is to talk about next week. You saw the video, uh, not specific to Easter, but here, here's this thing. Next week, we have something big, and it's called Easter. It's kind of like the Super Bowl of the Christian calendar. And the reason I want you to be thinking about Easter is because Easter is the absolute easiest inviting opportunity that you're going to have in the whole year. You, you see the, the guy in the video? It looked easy or awkward or whatever. But, but the reality is that in our culture, probably Christmas Eve, maybe Christmas Day, and definitely Easter, th those are just the top opportunities where even if you have no interest in God, no concept of God, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's Easter. We ought to be in church, right? Let's give it a try. So really want to be encouraging you guys to be thinking and praying and just acting on the opportunities that God gives you to, to invite people into our family, to, um, to just give people a chance to come to a place where they're going to hear the gospel and where they can have a chance to get invited to our family. So I want to challenge you um, Walk across the street, walk across the room. You got uh, neighbors and coworkers, you got classmates, roommates, whatever it is that you got. Take the opportunity to invite guys out. And if, if you guys are feeling really crazy, is there anybody who's feeling really crazy? No one, no one. You guys know me. You're like, okay, we got one, we got two. This is good. If you're feeling really crazy, um, I think on Good Friday, we're going to get some people together. We're going to go out to State Street, go out to the Diag, go out who knows where else. We'll take whatever Easter flyers we have left and we'll just give them out to people. And some of you guys, you get excited about those things. Probably most of you guys are like, that's creepy. That's scary. Uh, that, maybe that sounds like it's ineffective. For some of you, that is absolutely outside your comfort zone. And if that's you, that's totally cool. Welcome to Mosaic Church. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't, you don't have to be that guy. Um, but as we transition, as we start to think about the message for this morning, I want you to think about a time when you were ap on the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. Not the guy who's, who's hearing a pastor say, hey, this could be a good idea, do you want to do it, and you're freaking out. But I want you to be thinking about a time when there was something that you, that you wanted to do, that you were desperate to do, that you're like, crazy as this may sound, I am going to do this. I just can't imagine not doing it. I want you to think of a time when you could not help yourself. Okay? You were compelled. You could not help yourself. I, I don't know what the context is, but you're in this situation and you can't help yourself but taking the next step, saying the next word. It's, it's one more bite. It's one more click. It's one more kiss. It, it's one more episode of your favorite show. I want you to think about a time when, when you just couldn't stop yourself. You might have said, well, this isn't a great idea. This isn't, this isn't what I ought to be doing, but I have to do it. I'm going to do it. I want to do it, okay? You got your scenario, you've been in that situation. Um, you had to take the next step. You had to say the next word because there was some object that had captured your heart and it was compelling you to act. Okay, you're like that, that, that drug addict that's looking for the next high. You're like the chocolate fiend that's like, hey, it's Easter, there's, there's Easter eggs here. You're like the, the extrovert that just can't stop talking. Anybody ever spent time with me? You, you know that guy? Okay, do you, do you know those sorts of things from your own experience? Have you been in that situation? Do you know the feeling, the urge, the craving, the angst? To speak or to step, to taste or to touch. To, th there's something 
There's something that you just absolutely have to do because you are compelled. You feel just, just unexplainably drawn to this thing, even though nobody else feels it. Probably the best, the best example that I can think of is love, or, or maybe a better way to say it is infatuation. Anybody ever been infatuated? Okay, you, you, have anybody ever been in love? It's, it's, it's kind of the same thing, okay? That's what I'm talking about. So, so you're in that situation, and okay, if, you, if you're a guy, you, you've got this girl, and you're just fixated on her. And no one else really notices this particular girl. Maybe there's a couple other rivals, maybe a couple of other people notice this girl, but, but so every other girl, every other guy, they're fixated on something else, but you're fixated on this one. So when she walks into the room, when he walks into the room, you know, your, your, your pulse, it, it speeds up, your heart begins to race, you're just, you're, you're just drawn, you're, you're torn, you're consumed, you're compelled. You have to give your attention to this girl, and if you can work up the courage, you have to talk to this girl, and, and she walked into the room, nobody else noticed. Everyone else would look at you and say, you're just kind of crazy, but you don't even care because you're compelled. So you find yourself, you know, you're, you're this guy that uh, you, you went through high school English class, and every once in a while they wanted you to read poetry, and you're like, this is such a beating. I hate poetry. But all of a sudden, you're writing poetry. You're like going online. How do I write a love note? You're Googling it because, because you got to figure it out. And you're buying her flowers and you're buying her gifts. And you can't help yourself. You know that you're making a fool of yourself. No one could pay you to do what you're doing for this girl. But you are compelled. You have to do it. You have to act. You simply can't Stop yourself. And everyone, everyone looking around you, they're looking at you saying, he's crazy, or she, she's a nutcase, or what is wrong with this person? And the reality is there is nothing wrong with this person. It's completely normal. All of us do these sorts of things. Maybe it's for love, maybe it's for food, maybe it's for Netflix, maybe it's for something else. But all of us, we have these situations where we're compelled. It's completely normal. There's just a reality that something has captured our heart in a way that we absolutely have to act and we cannot stop ourselves. Have you been there? Have you experienced that? Do you know what it is to have your heart compelled? That's the imagery. That's the idea that we run across over and over and over as we read the New Testament. That's the Christian life. It's not duty. It's not have to. It's not ought to. What we see throughout the New Testament, what we see throughout the Christian life, is we see people who are compelled. We, we talk about inviting people out for Easter. I cannot make you do that. For some of you, I could not pay you enough money to walk across the street and, and give a flyer to your neighbor. It's just too scary. It's just too creepy. You would never do it. I, I can't motivate you to do that outwardly. It's not something I can push you to do. It's something for many of you, if you're ever going to do it, it cannot be a push. It has to be a pull. Your heart has to be compelled. But man, if your heart's compelled, then it's easy. I don't, I don't even have to mention it. Some of you guys, your, your, your hearts are so compelled, we printed off, we printed off Easter flyers, and, and, and one guy asked, how many Easter flyers you got? And, and the number that he wanted to give out was a greater number than we had printed. Okay? I got neighbors. I, 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 got, I got people who aren't my neighbors, but they're the next neighborhood over, and the next neighborhood, and the next neighborhood. Give me the flyer. I'll go door to door. I don't care. And some of you are like, door to door. They're going to think we're a cult. It's going to be awful. We can't even come to this church anymore. Okay? But when you're compelled, you don't even think about those things. Just forget it. Yeah, we're a little bit crazy. Who cares? Something has captured our hearts in a way that we cannot help but act. And that, my friends, is the Christian life. That's what we're talking about today. We're, we're talking about having our hearts captured in such a way that we cannot help but act. So this morning, um, we're, we're finished. Last week, we, did, uh, we wrapped up in 1 Samuel. Next week's Easter. This week, we're taking one week, and we're really trying to prepare our hearts for Easter and prepare our hearts for the opportunity that we have to engage the people around us who don't know Jesus, okay? So we're going to be in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. We're going to talk about being compelled. We're going to talk about having a single object so captivate our hearts that we can't help but act. Some of the questions that we're going to try to answer today, we're going to ask, um, 
What is God inviting us to be compelled by? Because there has to be an object. What is it that God wants to see compel our hearts? And what actions are we compelled toward? What, what actions are we compelled to take? And if we're not compelled at all, if there is nothing stirring in our hearts, we're going to try to figure out why not. Not in a condemning way, not in a heavy-handed way, but just, just in an honest way. If God the Holy Spirit works in the life of his people to, to try to compel them and to draw them to do certain things, to live certain ways, to value and to think in certain ways, if that's just what the Holy Spirit does and that's not taking place in my heart, man, what's the barrier? What's the obstacle? And how do we go to war with that obstacle? How do we destroy that barrier? So those are the questions we're trying to figure out. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. We're going to pick up with verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we're giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Okay, so when Paul says we, he's talking about himself and Timothy. At the beginning of the letter, you see, Paul, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, my brother. Okay, so we got these two guys, these two, these two leaders, not just in a local church, but these, these two leaders in this regional movement of, of church planning churches. We got Paul and Timothy, and, and they're going, and they're writing letters to individual churches. So when he says we, he's, he's talking about, about me and the other leaders. And when he says you, he's actually writing to a church. And some of the things that we're going to read today, you're, you're going to have this tendency to, to read them, and you're going to think, okay, he's talking to people who are outside the church. He wants them to be drawn to Jesus. But, and, and that may be true, but what Paul is doing is he's actually writing to the church in Corinth. So the you in there is the congregation, and, and just like our congregation, it's a mixed bag. Okay, so we've got some people who've come here this morning, and you are passionately pursuing Jesus. And all you want this morning is just saying, lift high the name of Jesus, point me to Jesus, give me a glimpse of Jesus, that I might see Jesus and my heart might be compelled. You know, on the other end of the spectrum, we, we, we've got people who've gathered with us today, and you're, and you're just trying to figure out, who is Jesus, and, and what do I want to do with Jesus, and, and is this crazy talk really as crazy as it sounds, okay? It's, it's a mixed bag. It's in, in any congregation, you've got believers, you've got non-believers. You've got, you got people who are really pursuing God. You've got people who are kind of in the middle. You know, okay, I know I love Jesus. Um, I know I want to follow Jesus. I'm not sure how much I want to follow Jesus. I don't know, I don't know if I like these ideas about following Jesus, but, but I'm here, and I'm trying. So that's who we're addressing. That's who we're talking about. All sorts of people. God, Paul, as he's writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's trying to hit all of us where we live. With that in mind, I want you to look at verse 13 again. Paul saying we. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. In other words, when, when some people looked at Paul's life and Timothy's life, they, they looked at how they thought and how they taught and what they valued and, and, and how they behaved. Some people on the outside looking in, they, they looked at Paul and Timothy, even from the church pew, and they said, these guys are crazy. These guys are totally out of their minds. But what we see in this passage is that, is that Paul doesn't try to, ref, to deflect that. He doesn't say, you think I'm crazy? You're crazy. Call me crazy, I'll call you crazy. Stick to glue, you know, whatever that little kid thing is. Okay? We don't see him doing that. He says, you think I'm crazy? I can own that. I, I'm, I'm not telling you I'm crazy, but, but yeah, yeah, I, I see where you get that. I see why you would think that. Here's the deal. If I'm crazy, it's for the sake of God. If I'm in my right mind, it's for you. What's he saying? He's saying that his heart has been captured. His... his his heart, his life, all of him, he's enamored. His heart is so wrapped up in who God is and in what Christ has done 
The, the way he lives, the way he acts, it's going to look crazy. And he's okay with that. Why am I crazy? I'm crazy for God. I love him. I believe in him. I believe he is who he says he is. That's life-changing. But I recognize that when I'm crazy, and, and I recognize this for you, when, when I start a message talking about, you know, going out on the diag and, and handing out flyers to strangers, some of you are like, that's crazy. So what, what Paul seems to be doing is he owns the fact that he's a little bit crazy. He's totally cool with being crazy because he serves a God who's worthy of being a little bit crazy for. If you've got some girl that you met like, three weeks ago, and you can go all crazy, goo guy writing love letters and buying flowers and be crazy if you heard them, by all means, God is worthy of your craziness. But he recognizes that, that, that people who aren't crazy for God really can't relate to that. So he's like, if I'm crazy, it's for God. If, if I'm in my right mind, here's what I'm doing. I'm dialing it back a notch or two or three or seven. I'm, I'm dialing it back as far as I think I have to dial it back in order to relate to you because I love you. If I'm not looking crazy right now, it's because I'm trying to be just normal enough to connect with you right now. Because I love you. And I want you to see my God for who he is. So, so that he might blow your mind and, and that you might go just a little bit crazy pursuing him. Make sense? If we're out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. If we're in our right minds, it's for the sake of you. What made Paul and Timothy crazy? What is it that they were trying to do that made people around them look at them and say, these guys must be out of their minds? Verse 11, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. Paul says, I know what it is to fear the Lord. We know what it is to fear the Lord. We know what it is to love God. We know what it is to know God. We know what it is to be overcome and enamored with God, to understand that he's powerful and that he's terrifying. He's so powerful, he's so strong, he's so great, he's so glorious, and yet he's also so good. We've caught a glimpse of who God is. We're, we're just beginning to see him for who he is. Man, and when we, when we catch a glimpse of God, the thing that I want to do is I want you to have that glimpse. We try to persuade men. So what we see here is that people thought that Paul and Timothy were crazy because they desperately tried to persuade people to see God for who he is. It's really that simple. People thought that they were crazy because they were desperately trying to help other people see God for who he is. Paul's like, man, if that makes me crazy, guilty. Praise God, that's the kind of crazy that I want to be. And I don't know about you, but, but, it, but if that's what makes you crazy, if you are desperate for your neighbors and coworkers and friends and family to see God for who he is, sign me up for that sort of crazy. That is exactly who I want to be. That is how I want to live. I want an object to capture my heart in such a way that I am compelled and inspired to act. I want to help you see God more clearly for who he is. I want, I want to try to help you see God more clearly than I see God so that you can challenge me to see God more clearly. That's the path that we want to be on. How do we become people who are desperate to persuade other people to see God for who he is? Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we're giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Okay, what's he talking about in here? Take pride in us. Don't take pride in us. What we are, who we are. Take pride in what is seen rather than what's in the heart. He's saying that if you start living a life that's kind of crazy, you're going to make people uncomfortable. Again, in any church, we got a mixed bag. And wherever you're at in the spectrum, welcome to Mosaic Church. We want to be patient with you. Uh, we want to help you take next steps. But we also want to be honest about the path that we're on. So here's the reality. If, if, if you, when, when people become a little bit crazy, when they become a little bit zealous, when they catch this vision of God and they're desperate to see other people catch this vision of God, they make other people uncomfortable, okay? You, you, you got one guy who's just going gangbusters and he's naturally saying, come with me. 
Join with me. We got hundreds of thousands of people all around us that don't know Jesus. Let's do something. And that makes many of the other people in the room uncomfortable. Okay, they say, okay, I, I get it. I love Jesus too. I want people to know about Jesus. I think you're crazy. I don't want to be crazy. Let's, let's not take it so far. People get uncomfortable. So you got some people who are just, they're, they're honestly trying to figure it out. And this is weird. We're on a spectrum. You got other people who are kind of digging in their heels and saying, I don't want to figure this out. I want to be comfortable. I, I want to come to church. I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to be inspired. Man, I, want, I got some motions that I want to go through. Okay? I'm going to get my life together. I'm, I'm going to keep up the outward appearances. I'm going to worship. I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to be a good girl. But stop messing with me. Okay? Paul's saying that there were some people in that church that they were very good on outward appearances. What they took pride in was outward appearance. Okay, we, we've, we've got it together. We look good. We're, we're going through the motions. Paul said, I don't, want, I don't want there to be people in our church that are taking pride in outward appearance. I don't want anybody to stop there. I want us to break through that and really deal with what's going on in our hearts. So Paul says, I'm in this really awkward situation because I'm trying to paint a picture of what it looks like to follow Christ, of what it looks like to have your heart captured by Christ. And I got other people around me who are saying, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. That's not the Christian life. Don't do that. That's, that's superstars. That's zealots. That's apostles. That's ridiculous. We don't want to go there. And so Paul says, I'm not, I think you know who I am. I think God knows who I am, and I think that it's clear to you. I think it's clear to your conscience who I am. Guys, you know how I live. I, I think you understand that I'm not trying to exalt myself. I'm not trying to lift myself up. But, but Paul's saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to, in honesty, in gentleness, I'm, I'm going to try to persuade you to see that this is what it looks like to really follow Christ. This is what maturity looks like. I'm trying to live out maturity before you. And I want you to see that. And I want you to take pride in it. He says, I want you to be able to take pride in us. And, and it sounds awkward, but here's what I think he's saying. I want you to see this example of maturity, of a heart that's being transformed, of a heart that's being compelled, of a heart that's being drawn. I want you to see that, and I want you to identify with that and say, that is the path I want to go down. That, I'm going to take pride in that. I'm going to, I'm going to chase after that rather than taking pride in what is seen. Rather than just getting our lives together and going through the outward appearance. We don't, we don't want to pretend. We don't want to perform. We want to see hearts transformed. Amen? That's what Paul's going after. He's saying, let's not stop short of what's going on in our hearts. People thought Paul and Timothy were crazy because they desperately tried to persuade people to see who God really is. What Paul's trying to get across is that being crazy for the sake of the gospel is normal. Okay? Our God is just that good. We're, we're talking about a God. We're talking about a God who, who left heaven to become a man. We're, we're talking about a God who, uh, who, who was not just emptied himself to be born as, as a man, but he emptied himself to be born in a barn. He set aside majesty to be born in a barn. And then he came and he lived this life of radical service, of radical sacrifice. He set aside his own desires. He set aside, he set aside anything that he might want. He turned away from, from all sorts of temptations, from, from wealth and from power and from sex and everything that tempts up. And he said, no, I'm going to live for the glory of the Father. I'm going to live for the good of the people that I'm trying to reach. He, he, he did all of this, ultimately culminating in him coming to the cross and dying on the cross that, you and, that our sins might be forgiven and that you and I might be reconciled to God. Paul's saying, man, when we catch a glimpse of that, of who our God is and what our God has done, that is worthy of being crazy. Being a little bit crazy for the gospel, that's normal. He's saying, not living for the gospel. What these guys are advocating is a poor, pathetic, and anemic imitation of the Christian life. Okay? 
Having a life that is, in some sense, vaguely Christian, but it's not living for the glory of God. It's not living to see the gospel advance to the ends of the earth. He says that is a poor, pathetic, and anemic imitation of the Christian life. These guys come to Paul. They look at Paul and say, he's crazy. He's trying to be a super Christian. He's, it's unattainable. It's ridiculous. And he says, no, it's normal. It's normal. And he doesn't say, I'm going to try to push you to do this. He's not going to say, I'm going to make you do this. I'm going to guilt you into do this. But he is saying, this is normal. And I don't want you to settle for less. Instead, I want your hearts to be compelled. Which is exactly what he goes into next. What is it that is supposed to captivate our hearts? What is God inviting us to be compelled by? Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What captivates our heart? What compels us? We're compelled to live for God when we set our eyes on Jesus. For Christ's love compels us. Again, it's what we already talked about. It's thinking about the love of Christ and what he has done, culminating on the cross, but just, just all of what God has done for us. I mean, you, you, look, at, you look at the whole creation. God, God, God's a Trinitarian God. God eternally exists in three persons, so God was never lonely. God was never needy. God was, God was never bored. There was always joy. There was always overflow. There was always relationship. And it was out of that overflowing joy that he said, I'm going to create humanity. And then humanity rebelled. Humanity said, we know better. We, we want to do our own thing. We don't want to follow you. We don't want to worship you. We don't want to give glory to you. Humanity, Adam and Eve, our fathers alienated themselves from God. And yet, and yet God said, even though you bring nothing to the table, even though you do nothing for me, even though I'm completely satisfied in myself, I choose to love you. And I choose to pursue you. So God became a man. Jesus stripped himself of glory and power and majesty again to be born in a barn. And he followed that path all the way to the cross where he died as a substitutionary atonement for our sins. Paul says, you want to live a life that's compelled? You want this stuff to begin to make sense? He says, reflect on the cross. Reflect on the goodness of your God. He says, the love of Christ compels us. Jesus' love for me compels me. When Paul and Timothy, when they reflected on these truths, their hearts cried out for Christ's love compels us. It grabs us. It squeezes us. It shakes us. It moves us. Christ's love compels compels us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Okay, he's saying that the reason that I get the benefit of Christ's death is because I have been united with Christ through faith, okay? That's, that's how the justice of God works out, that, that God died, and he counts it as though I died. The eternal wrath of God the Father was poured out on the back of God the Son for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. And yet God counts it as justice that that payment be applied to my sin and to yours. His payment is applied to my life because I have been united to Christ through faith. He says, one died for all and therefore all died. If I'm united to Christ in his death so that I can get the benefit of his death, then, then I'm united with Christ in death. I'm going to count myself dead. And he died for all that those who live, that's all of us, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Think about this idea that we should no longer live for ourselves. It's so countercultural that we don't even have categories for it. Think about it this afternoon. You don't, how do you even do that? Oh, I go to a soup kitchen. I do whatever. But, but you start analyzing your life. Everything I do is for myself. I, I, I go to work to make money. You go to work to make money for yourself, for your family, so you can have what you want. You get a day off. What's the question that you ask yourself? What do I want to do with my day off? 
Some of you are like, I'm a parent. I, I don't have that luxury. Yeah, and you, and you daydream and you fantasize about the day that your kid turns 18. And you, and, and, and you can just you can do what you want on your day off. Love you, Luke. So excited to have you around on my day off. We don't even have categories for what it would look to, to do something other than living for ourselves. It's so normal to live for ourselves. It's the air that we breathe. It's the water that we swim in. Of course we live for ourselves. What else would we do? What else would we live for? But what Paul says is that I found something better. I found something more compelling in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his substitutionary death and resurrection, death for our sins, resurrection unto life. In in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I see something so much more beautiful, so much more worthy, that I want to live for that. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I've I've chased that path. I've, I've pursued that path. I know what it is to live for myself, and it's not all that satisfying. I got something better to live for. And the more I reflect on the truth of the gospel and the beauty of the gospel, it compels me to live for it and for God rather than for myself. Okay, what does that look like? How do we flesh it out? What kinds of actions is God compelling us toward? First thing we see in verse 16, we're going to see that we're compelled to change the way we see people. We're compelled to think differently and love differently and value differently, particularly in regard to people. Verse 16, so from now on, We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We don't see Jesus the way we used to see him. We don't see other people the way we used to see them. So I want to ask you, has the gospel changed the way you look at people? Has the gospel changed the way you look at people? There's this natural thing that all of us have and that is, it's still a true dynamic in every person's life in this room, I promise you. There's this natural dynamic where we look at people with pride. We're continually sizing people up. We're continually comparing. We're continually saying, I'm smarter than you. Whatever you got, you know, I'm taller than you. I'm younger than you. I'm older than you. Whatever it is that you've got, you're trying to justify yourself. You're trying to compare people. You're looking down on people. You're judging people. I'm in church today. They're not in church today. I'm going to go invite the heathen because they're bad and I'm good. Okay? There's this dynamic where we're continually looking on people with pride. Have you allowed the gospel to transform the way you look at people? Have you allowed the gospel to bring humility into your perspective towards other people? That, that you, don't say, you don't try to justify yourself and say how you're better. You say, man, I am jacked up. And God loved me anyway. My neighbor cannot possibly be more messed up than I am. I know what I think. I know the deep, dark corners of my heart. If God can transform me, if God can compel me, then certainly he can get that guy. That guy's nice. Have we let the gospel change our perspective? Have we let the gospel break our pride? Have... All of us, we also have this tendency to look at people with frustration. It's an extension of our pride. You know, people are an annoyance. Kids, interrupting my day off, man. Okay, frustration. Somebody cutting you off on the highway, whatever. Have we allowed that frustration that we have towards people for messing up our day and messing up our plans and messing up our dreams to be replaced by tenderness and love that God has towards people? Has the gospel changed the way you look at people? Friends, do you notice people at all? Do you notice people who don't have something to offer you? When you're walking through a large building, do you notice the custodian? In a restaurant, do you notice the busboy? You know, do you notice the waiter? Do you notice the cashier? Do you notice your fellow shoppers? Do you notice your neighbors? Do you notice people? Uh, this, week, this week, I went to Little Caesars. I was getting my hot and ready. That's what they're known for, and they usually deliver on that. But, but this day, they were backed up. It was a busy lunch hour, okay? I, I was going to have to wait. So, you know, I'm, I'm an extrovert, and I like to be an evangelist. I want to apply what I'm saying, so I'm trying to get to know people. I'm getting to know people in the lobby. People are cycling through. We're actually standing there for a while, just getting to know people. It was good. Uh, almost started a Euchre game. If we had a table, we would have, and if we had cards. So we, we were quite a bit short of a Euchre game, but it was an idea I had. Um, 
And so people start to cycle through and whatever, and, and, and now we're down to where the person who I've been in the room the longest with is the guy who's, who's running the register and making the pizzas and all this stuff, and, and I'm in and out of there. And, you know, I've seen him before. I've talked to him a little bit before. So I'm, I'm talking to him a little bit more, trying to get to know him because, because I'm interested, okay? And, and at some point in the conversation, I asked him, what's your name? He said, yeah, I'm Brian. Um, and he says, and you're Shannon, Shannon Nielsen. I'm like, and some of you, I know you're thinking you eat way too much pizza, and that may be true. I, I, I want to tell you, he made the point. I, I know you don't come in here a lot, but you're a regular. Yeah, I mean, I know... I, I know who you are. So, so he said, he made it a point that I'm not eating too much pizza. Of course, he has a, a dog in that fight. But, um, man, I was blown away. I asked him his last name because I wanted to know. I'm like, you're telling me the pizza guy is taking more interest in my life as a pastor than I am taking in his? Oh, that's sad. That's pathetic. Okay, that's my pride. I'm judging. I'm thinking I should be better. Whatever. But man, I, I want to care more about the pizza guy than the pizza guy cares about me. Not so I can be better than him, but because the love of Christ compels me. I am praying for Brian. I invite you to pray for Brian, man. Probably going to have to get pizza sometime this week so I can invite him to Easter. Do we notice people? Do we care about people? Do we care about strangers because the gospel compels us to care? Do we see people differently? Here's what C.S. Lewis says about this. He says, it's a serious thing to live in a society of immortal beings. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, and I'll add sports teams. These are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Are we allowing the gospel to change our hearts? Are we allowing the gospel to captivate us? Are we allowing the gospel to compel us to see people differently? Lewis is he's talking about this process, this transformation that's beginning to go, to go to a more glorious reflection of who God is as he reshapes us from the inside out or to a horror and a corruption as we continue to choose to push him out of our lives. For those of us who are in Christ, this transformation's already begun. So we're compelled to turn away from who we were and embrace new life in Christ. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, is the old completely gone? No. Is the new completely here? No. We live in a time of now and not yet, and yet is, has the change begun? Absolutely. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation with new desires and new drives and new values and new delights, and God invites us to embrace that change. God wants to transform us into, our own, into his own likeness. And, and the, more we, the more we live in this world with all of its distractions, and the more we pursue the same things that everyone else in the world pursues, the less inclined we're going to be to turn to God and say, transform me, change me, remake me into your own image. But the more we get in touch with reality, the more we look to God and who he is, the more our hearts will cry out and say, may it be. God, Take my brokenness, take my wretchedness, take my selfishness, and begin and continue this process of reshaping me back into your image. Are we allowing the gospel to compel us 
to embrace our new identity, to embrace who God is reshaping us to be. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us, that means restored our relationship, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us, he's entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. So first, we're compelled to change the way we see people. Second, we're compelled to turn away from who we were and embrace new life in Christ. Third, we're compelled to share the good news with others. We see this in verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We're his messengers. We're his missionaries. We're his mouthpiece. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you. We beg you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. He's saying, I want you to catch the magnitude. I want you to allow yourself to be compelled. I want you to be reconciled. And I want you to understand that he's not saying this to people outside the church. He's saying it to people inside the church. He's saying it to this mixed bag of people. He's saying it to people who are already passionately pursuing Christ. He's saying it to people who who say, yeah, I love love Jesus. I'm trying to figure it out. I want to go further. He's saying it to people who, who haven't begun to decide what they want to do with Jesus or who have no interest in Jesus. He's saying it to all of us. Mature believer, whatever it is, he's saying, be reconciled to God. He's saying that... A normal aspect of the Christian life is that our hearts would be compelled by who God is and by what God has done. And that when our hearts are not compelled, that's indicative that something is broken inside of us. And to one degree or another, I promise you, for everyone in this room, our hearts are distracted. Our hearts hearts have idols. Our hearts are not compelled in the way that God desires them to be compelled. So he comes to all of us and he says, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Allow God to transform your heart. Allow God to compel your heart. And then he turns back to the gospel because what he's he's looking for, he's saying, I'm begging you to see what I see. I'm begging you to allow, to reflect and to allow the gospel to seep deeper into your life to the point that it actually begins to transform your heart. And so with that in mind, he turns back to the gospel one last time. Verse 22. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, to be the object of God's wrath in our place. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we, that's you and I, pastor and churchgoer, Christian and non-Christian, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that in all of our filth, in all of our selfishness, in all of our brokenness, in all of our guilt and shame, that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might be made clean and spotless and perfectly pure. Oh, that our hearts would be compelled. I told you at the beginning, Easter Sunday's coming, and uh, Easter Sunday will come and go. We'll get another shot in a year, okay? Um, for our church, because we have so many young people, typically on Easter Sunday, we, we, bring, in, uh, we bring in enough new people and outsiders and people checking it off that it, that it uh, a bit more than offsets the people who are traveling to be home at grandma's house or mom's house or whatever. Um, Easter, Easter isn't the end-all opportunity. But it is a great opportunity. It is the easiest inviting opportunity that that you're going to get in the coming year. So so I'm coming to this passage just just begging you to allow God to compel your heart. To allow God to transform your heart. I'm, I'm asking God to transform my heart. I'm praying. I'm saying in my heart, God, oh, that you would draw us. Oh, that you would transform us. Oh, that you would compel us. To see you for who you are and to have a passion that others might see you for who you are. What God desires for us, what I long for us, is that we would have hearts that would truly sing the glories of God. Okay, I'm not saying that we would gather once in a while and we'd sing five songs or something. I'm saying my desire is that 24-7 throughout the week, we would have hearts that would sing the glory of God. 
that would, that would set our hearts obsessively on the God that we worship and that that would transform everything that we do, that our hearts would be compelled and all of the actions, all the inviting, everything else in the Christian life would simply take care of itself because our hearts are compelled. And yet so often our hearts are not compelled. So what are the barriers? What are the things that we need to go to war with? What we see in this passage is that it's just a normal thing. If you've been reconciled to God, that the Holy Spirit would work, be working in you and it would be draw, the Holy Spirit, he would be drawing you to try to reconcile others to God. And yet we look at our hearts and so often this is not happening. So if the Holy Spirit is not compelling your heart toward the mission, why not? What's the barrier? What's the obstacle? What do we need to go to war with? First possibility, it may be that the Holy Spirit simply is not in you. The Holy Spirit is not compelling your heart and changing you from the inside out because he is not inside of you. Because you're not a Christian, because you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you say, I believe in God, I, I go to church occasionally, I go to church a lot, whatever. But you've never been regenerated. You've never, you've never had God the Holy Spirit come in and give you new life through faith in Jesus Christ, by grace through faith. So if that's where you're at, I mean, that's the first step. That's, that's what we need. We need to surrender to God or there's never going to be transformation. Some of you are like, I know that I'm in Christ. Yes, I'm not compelled, but I, I know that I'm a Christian. Or, or maybe, maybe some of you are like, okay, I'm compelled, but my, the feeling that I have of being compelled, when we talk about God, when we talk about his beauty, when we talk about his glory, I get it. And I want to share the gospel. I want to be compelled into mission, but it's intimidating. It's scary. And there's a breakdown in there based on fear that keeps me from action. Anybody ever feel that? I feel that. Okay, there, there was a time when I felt one of my greatest fears was that I'm going to get it wrong. You know? We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking, what, what, is, what does God want? And, and the message is quite simple. God wants you to believe that he is God. That you're inadequate. That you're broken. That, that he paid the penalty for your sin. He says, come. Trust me, worship me, follow me, believe in me. Okay, it's not all that complicated. But there's this fear, you know, when you're getting started and you're like, okay, do I really get this? Am I sharing it the right way? What if I leave something out and people go to hell? Okay? If that's where you're at, then, then let's take some time. Let's, let's, let's get together this week. Let's make sure that you understand the gospel in such a way that you can share it with confidence. Other fears that come up, um, man, what if I offend this person? What if a fear that I still experience in my life? You know, I'm, I'm building relationships with people. I'm loving people. I'm, I'm loving them because I want them to see my God for who he is. And, but, but at every turn, I'm praying. I'm, I'm looking for the right opportunity to try to point them toward Jesus. And so I've got this anxiety inside of me that says, is this the right moment? Because I get this temperament that just wants to charge through whatever door, you know, even if the door isn't there, it's just a wall. You know, so I don't, I don't want to just be foolish about it. I don't, I don't want to blow my one opportunity that this person's ever going to get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it's a goofy anxiety, okay? I experience it, but I think it's goofy. Yeah, yeah there's, there's wisdom in, in, in figuring it out and not being obnoxious all the time and uh, not reading people, seeing where people are at, seeing if they're interested, whatever. But I think this fear that I'm going to blow it is, is based in the premise that I'm the one who brings people to salvation, and that's simply not true. Either God is going to do the work to bring new life to a person who does not have life, or the work is not going to get done. The work depends on God. Therefore, I pray to God, I trust in God, I go and I give it a shot. Either God the Holy Spirit is going to move in this moment, or he's not. And nothing I do, nothing I say is going to change that, okay? So I simply join with him and say... I want to be a part of this process. What are the other barriers? What else keeps us from being compelled? Some, some of you would say, I know I'm in Christ. I used to be compelled, or I have an inkling of what you're talking about, but I'm not compelled now. Why not? If the Holy Spirit works to compel us into the mission to bring the gospel to people who don't have the gospel, and, my, and the Holy Spirit is in me and I'm not compelled, why not? I think for most of us, it's, it's because... Our hearts are distracted, our minds are distracted, our lives are distracted. We just have so many other things that we're chasing after. Okay, we've got career, we've got school, we've got family, we've got sports, we've got 
We got hobbies. We got all sorts of things that are occupying our hearts and they're simply squeezing it out. Your heart's only so big. Your heart can't be drawn to and enamored with everything. Okay? And if you're crowding, if you're trying to cram all of these other passions into your heart that, you know, they might be good, they might be fun, that, but in light of eternity, they're quite trivial. Eventually, you squeeze this passion for the beauty of who God is out of your heart until there's nothing left to compel you. And as Americans um, who are obsessed with technology, who are, um, who are wealthy beyond the imaginings of the world, who, who are overfed, who, who have everything that we want, who are overindulged, frankly, I think this is where most of us land. Okay? Looking out at you today, I, I, I genuinely believe that most of you are here because you want to worship God and you want to glorify God with your life. I know some of you are still trying to figure that out, but I think so many of us are like, yes, I want to pursue God. Help me to pursue God. And, and we're going to get home today and, and it's going to be like, oh, and it's, it's a movie marathon. The, the eighth Star Wars is coming out soon and I got to start now and, and get ready for it or, or March Madness or whatever it is. And we have these good intentions because we want to pursue God, but, but our hearts are just cluttered. Our, our hearts are full of other things. So we simply don't take time to reflect on who God is, that we might see him for who he is, that we might see his glory, that our hearts might be drawn, our hearts might be compelled to action. Amen? Two verses and we're done. As God's fellow workers... So Paul, an apostle, and Timothy, they're talking to the congregation, and they're saying, not as people who sit in the pews, not not as people who don't know anything about this and need to be bossed around or told what to do. They're saying, no, you're my peers. You're my fellow workers in this. So he says to them, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. We urge you not to waste this opportunity, not to hear and fail to respond, not to believe but fail to act. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to beg God to move. So these closing verses, they're a call to repentance, and they're not a call that's primarily addressed to those people who are outside the church looking in that they need to come to salvation. They're a call to sanctification. They're a call for those of us who are in Christ to empty our cluttered hearts of all the things that would distract us from Christ so that we might continue this process of being reconciled to God of seeing him for who he is, of of being captured and enamored and compelled by the glory and the beauty of who God is and what he has done. In order that our actions, whether it be inviting or anything else that we might do in the Christian life, in order that our actions might simply take care of themselves because our hearts have been changed by the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this body. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to preach it. Um, God, I thank you for, the, for the, so many people we have who love you and who want to know you and who want to pursue you. And God, I thank you that you've surrounded us by hundreds of thousands of people who don't know you. Lord, I pray that no one would walk out of here feeling guilty or shamed that they need to hand out an Easter card to someone. But Lord, I pray that each one walking out of here this morning would be further down the path to seeing their heart compelled by who you are. And Lord, will you just work out all the rest in your own time and in your own way. Amen.